Right, well, um, it's a great pleasure to be back here at ESI to um, uh, give a talk, um, one of many over, over the years. Uh, I suppose I ought to give just a little bit of background. Some of you may have heard this before. Um, I've been working with Avian for over 20 years now, but initially on nonlinear uh, water waves, that sort of thing. Uh, a few years ago, Adrian then quite out of the blue, um, thought it might be quite a good idea to start looking at the mathematical fluid dynamics of um, atmospheric and oceanic flows. It was an area which I, I have to admit that I absolutely ran away from before Adrian pushed me in that direction. I thought that mathematical fluid dynamics probably wouldn't be very useful. Lots of physics, physical ideas, lots of modeling, but could, and I regard myself as a classically trained um, uh, fluid dynamicist, whether it would be possible to make headway in that particular arena. After, with some reluctance, I eventually agreed to start investigating and uh, then collaboration developed. So I'm going to describe the work that Adrian and I have done for the last five, six, seven years, something, something like that. Um, I was rather surprised that the sort of approach that I'm going to describe to you now works. I hope I can convince you that it works using the philosophy that um, is uh, conventional in mathematical fluid dynamics, at least in the British school. That is, we just start with a full set of equations in fluid mechanics, um, non-dimensionalize, um, find parameters, hopefully just one parameter. Well, we'd like to get an exact solution, but that's not going to happen. But the next best thing is that we can do everything via a single parameter, and all the other parameters can be held order one fixed in the limiting process and just um, see where that takes us. Um, because of the obvious complexity of what I'm going to describe to you, I'm not going to go into a lot of fine detail. There will be equations. And if you want to go back and look at the screens at a later date, <coughs> excuse me, you will be able to check more carefully some of the fine detail. I really want to give you an overview. Also, because of the complexity, I'm going to emphasize atmospheric flows. So I'll start with that. And then I'll move on and say a little bit about oceanic flows. They are essentially simpler, more straightforward, but the philosophy is exactly the same. Um, we have rather a lot of ground to cover, so I guess I should uh, get underway. So I'm not going to read that out, but that gives you an idea of what I'm going to try and cover from essentially the ideas, the philosophy, if you like, um, say a bit about the atmosphere, <clears throat> tack on the end, the um, uh, oceanic aspect and um, comments and concluding remarks, giving an overview of what I've tried to, tried to show you. Right, so model and method. Uh, as I've just indicated, we start with a full set of general governing equations. So for example, that would be Navier-Stokes equations for um, uh, compressible flow, um, variable eddy viscosity. We're going to obviously be in a rotating frame. We want to be in spherical coordinates. We need a mass, an equation of mass conservation. And because we're doing dealing with um, the atmosphere, an equation of state, the first law of um, thermodynamics, that constitutes our model. What you might want to debate, and um, we can refine it, could be some very sophisticated boundary conditions, um, are the way in which viscosity is described in the equations, for example. But once you've made those decisions, that's it. We don't do any more modeling. We do um, formal non-dimensionalization and asymptotics on the equations and just see where that leads us. Um, so as I've just said, yes, uh, what I regard as the um, familiar methods in mathematical fluid dynamics, we non-dimensionalize, introduce the relevant parameters, and then we're going to try and keep all the parameters bar one fixed. By fixed, I mean order one. They do not vary under the limiting process. And the limiting process is going to be the thin shell approximation. My claim is that is all you need to do. As long as you set the problem up appropriately, you can then proceed. <coughs> so let me just list some of the issues that um, might well be <coughs> at the forefront of your thinking at the moment. So. Is the thin shell approximation alone going to be sufficient to do the job? Um, if you're worried about it, can we accommodate the Earth's geoid? More important in the atmosphere, less important in, in an ocean, which is a relatively 
in terms of the Earth of limited extent. Um, if we're dealing with the atmosphere, what role, and you'll see what I mean by this a little bit later on, what's the role of the first law of thermodynamics? Um, obviously, can we recover all the standard and familiar results that one sees in, in geophysics? And how do they arise? Um, obviously, we want to ask what is new and different, hopefully, maybe important as well, um, that makes this worth exploring. The background material, I'm not going to give you very fine detailed references, but the various papers that we've produced over the years are in those journals and with those years. One thing I will just comment on, you will see that we did start essentially with the um, ocean work, and that's the slightly earlier papers here. Um, it was about three or so years ago that we really got stuck into um, the corresponding problem with uh, associated with the atmosphere. Right, so um, remember I'm going to describe the um, atmospheric problem uh, in more detail, and that'll give us all the philosophy, I hope, and then just say a little bit about the ocean afterwards. So bear in mind these comments are associated with the atmosphere. So um, first of all, well, we need a coordinate system which will apply to any um, problem we're going to be looking at. So we have a standard right-handed um, spherical coordinate system. We're going to have an Earth, which is um, spinning about its north-south axis. Uh, however, we do need to give some thought to the geoid. So we're going to model the geoid as an ellipsoid. Um, this is um, pretty good as a representation of the geoid. It's probably, I think the estimate is, is out by about 100 meters at some point south of India, something like that, relative to the geoid, okay, the ellipsoid representing modeling the geoid. We use the normal to the sea level uh, ellipsoid to uh, identify points above and below. And then the velocity and gravity components in that system are then decomposed into the appropriate components in the underlying spherical system. It's what we call the spherical geopotential, hybrid spherical geopotential system. This enables us to uh, give a very accurate representation of the geoid and still take advantage of the fact that the underlying system is spherical coordinate system, which is much, much easier to handle. Uh, I've just put this last comment here because you will see a beta appearing in a moment or two. Uh, and I thought I ought to just alert you to the fact that it's that, it's the geodetic uh, latitude. We'll come across it later. Okay. Um, the upshot of all this excuse me, one thing that's happened, I'm, I used to do an awful lot of teaching, and the one thing that's happened as I've got a little bit older is I need water. As I had to explain to my students on occasions, I promise you, it's water. It might look like gin, or it might look like vodka, but I promise you, it's water. Uh, right, the um, uh, presence of the um, geoid, geoid representation, if you like, the ellipsoid representation, which is modeling it, obviously is going to bring in an eccentricity. So we now have, unfortunately, a second parameter. It's a relatively unimportant one there, but it is there and we can handle it. So underlying this is not really one parameter. There's only one parameter that really matters. I'll define it for you in a moment or two properly. It's the one I'm going to be calling epsilon. It's going to be the thin shell parameter. But we do have this auxiliary parameter, which describes the correction necessary to go from a sphere to the ellipsoid, which is a measure of the geoid. All right, so what's going to happen here? This is one of the reasons why I'm going to be dealing with the atmosphere first, because this complication does not arise in the ocean. We have a background state of the atmosphere. Um, so at order one in this system, we're going to see the background state of the atmosphere, and we need to an appropriate solution of the proper governing equations that describe the background state of the atmosphere. We can't um, model it or approximate it in the sense that we have the equations for it. We've got to make sure we have a suitable solution of that underlying system. At order delta, this is the new bit we've now just introduced, we have um, the geoid correction, if you like, to, to the geometry. It is essentially a geometric issue that we've got here. And then we'll find that at order epsilon, as long as we've defined all our parameters, variables with 
sufficient care, we can get all the dynamics and thermodynamics of the moving atmosphere. They will appear at the order epsilon correction. Obviously, after that, you get higher order terms, which will give you interactions between relatively unimportant ones, particularly um, between delta and epsilon, but you'll have higher order epsilon terms, epsilon squared, epsilon cubed terms appearing. One other comment I should make. We are not in the business of trying to construct the beginning of um, a, a series for which we have to prove convergence. Almost always, these asymptotic expansions are not convergent. They're going to be, if treated in the conventional sense, they're going to be divergent. So you have to use the, if you want numerical estimates, you have to use the techniques associated with estimating divergent series, which means that for a given set of the values of the variables, you can find that number of terms which will minimize the er error. You cannot, of course, ever get the error tending to zero. But that is not what we're in the business of doing. What we're trying to do here is to use the parameter, or parameters just about delta and epsilon, to label terms, to identify terms, and extract those terms from the underlying system. That is what we try and do in, it, it, at least it's what I think we should be trying to do if we're dealing with um, asymptotic methods within mathematical flow dynamics. We're identifying terms and extracting terms and they'll have a particular meaning at epsilon, epsilon squared, or whatever. Right, so um, just for the record, that is where we have started for the atmosphere. Um, and we've got a variable um, viscosity in there, you'll observe. Uh, some of the more sophisticated work that we've done in terms of eddy viscosity in the ocean, we've had two different um, eddy viscosities, one horizontal and one vertical. All of that can be handled relatively straightforwardly using the, um, the technique that I'm going to show you. But that is, that's the model, if you like. That's the underlying model. It is a fully extended Navier-Stokes equation um, rotating spherical coordinates. Uh, of course, we're going to, although that's just the definitions that you're probably reasonably familiar with. Um, obviously, we're going to have an equation of mass conservation. And we also, in the case of the atmosphere, we're going to need uh, a description of the gas, the atmosphere itself. So we have um, an equation of uh, a state and the first law. Okay, sorry, maybe I, I didn't hold that long enough. Okay, and the first law. Okay, so now we non-dimensionalize. So we've, we've got our model, if you like. Now we're going to do work on it. We don't make any more uh, modeling simplifications. We're going to now follow, if I may use the phrase, follow your nose. You just do the natural thing. So you non-dimensionalize, introduce parameters with a little bit of care and just see where that leads us. So here we go then. So um, the uh, crucial parameter, um, is that one there, which measures the deviation from the, the, a constant radius, if you like, um, is going to measure the fact that the atmosphere, and indeed the ocean, relative to the radius of the Earth is thin. That's our fundamental assumption that we are, have got a thin shell, maybe over all the Earth, if it was the atmosphere, or regions um, of the Earth, if it was just the ocean. Um, we into, we I will talk about both steady and unsteady flow. So I've got a suitable time scale. Um, ah, I held it too long. Um, and the time scale there uh, corresponds to about three and a half hours, something like that. Um, there are other problems that we've looked at where we've made an adjustment to the time scale to be longer. We don't really need it any shorter, but we might want it a little bit longer. That can be accommodated. And we've done that in, in some of our um, applications. Right, so now let's work our way through. Um, here is that um, transformation that I was alluding to. Um, this is the non-dimensional velocity associated with the ellipsoid. Um, that's in physical variables. The prime is denoting that it's a physical variable. That's non-dimensionalized and it is transformed so that the, um, the uh, u, v, and w here are now associated with a spherical coordinate system. And because of 
And to be consistent with the thin shell, then we must make sure the motion in the vertical direction is small, measured by epsilon, relative to motion in the horizontal direction, which explains why you'll see an epsilon associated with W sitting in there. You can easily see from the equation of mass conservation that has to be the case for consistency. Um, and we've obviously got to carry out non dimensionalization We're in the atmosphere, so we've got to deal with the um, the temperature. Uh, the this uh, normalization of the temperature here that's about eight hundred degrees K, which means that in the troposphere um, you're going from what something like 0.36 up to 0.27 as you go from the bottom to the top of the um, uh, troposphere. Right, and then we have our various parameters. So we've got a Reynolds number, as you'd expect. We've got um, thermal diffusivity. We've got a term that is measuring uh, gravity, G, uh, and obviously CP. Um, I've given you the values of two of them because they're pretty well, in terms of the standard values, they're, they're pretty well known, about 0.72 and about 5.25. You might think that we ought to make some adjustment, consideration for this, which is going to be 10 to the 5, maybe 10 to the 6, and this, which is maybe 10 to the minus 5. But you, it, it, it's immaterial. The actual numerical value is immaterial. They can be as large or as small as you like. They are not treated as, they're independent parameters, so I can treat them as fixed as epsilon tends to zero. So at a later stage, if I want to take advantage of them being very large or very small, which might be useful in some numerical sense, we can do that. But we're not building it in. It's not part of the assumptions or the modeling. We can retain these parameters throughout. OK, so we now construct the initial stages of the asymptotic expansion. In some of our work, we've looked at nonlinear ways. We've got to go to higher order and probably use a slightly different spatial and time scale. But here, I'm just going to look at the, uh, the perturbation of the background state. So uh, that's going to be the background state. There is the geoid correction. And this, I claim, is going to have everything you'd ever want is actually going to appear in that Q1 term. And Q stands here for all the variables that are involved. So, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, go ahead. Yes, indeed it does. Exactly right, exactly right. Yes, it's measured normal to the ellipsoid, yes. All right, so, um, uh, obviously we've got higher order terms, which we're definitely not going to be discussing here. Uh, leading order. We've now got the equations that describe the background state of the atmosphere. Bits of this, I'm sure, will be familiar to some of you. Uh, and notice, of course, no surprise here, the velocity field appears here. OK, so we can solve independently of the um, first law. We can solve to obtain the solution as described here. Notice that we've now got a correction due to the fact that we're in spherical geometry automatically. Um, and the first law now reads that. The classical solution and the solution that we are going to want here, uh, others are available, I'll comment on that in just a moment, uh, it simply is the one that removes at leading order the velocity field. Okay, uh, the, the choice then is the one that I've indicated here. And so we get that as our solution. It's just the linear reduction in temperature as you go upwards. The formulation I'm giving you here, and we described it in outline in one of our papers, can be applied to the stratosphere and the mesosphere. As long as continuum mechanics applies, then we can go ahead. And, but of course, in that case, the choice you make is not that one. The choice you make now means that that term is not zero, and therefore, the, there's a contribution um, as the fluid particles move around. There is a heat input or heat extraction. It's normally heat input, um, a latent heat, if you like, which will contribute to the, the Q. And at this point, I can now tell you, give you an indication of how we're going to treat the first law. Of course, it will be wonderful 
if we could completely describe the thermodynamics and then use that as the input to give you the dynamics. That would be wonderful. But that is technically very, very difficult to do. Uh, well, in, in the sense that um, we can make that anything we like and adjust the temperature accordingly, yes. And indeed, if you go to um, beyond the uh, uh, troposphere, that can be done. We haven't looked at it in detail because it's most of the weather and everything we're interested in is in the troposphere. So we've limited ourselves to that. Sorry, when you say moisture, do you mean the heat exchange associated with it? Yes. Um, if that is associated with moving particles, the answer is yes. In other words, if you tell me what the dynamics are, so I know exactly what's happening at, in, the, in terms of this term, I will interpret it as a suitable heat input or extraction. Yeah. Yes. That can't be done. That can't be done in this simple, this, this approach. The, the, the philosophy I'm trying to um, suggest to you is that we try and sort out the dynamics because I think we can handle the dynamics, we can see the dynamics, we can measure the dynamics, and use the first law as the basis for after the event, interpreting what the heat has got to be, at least within this version, or the slightly earlier version, this has been slightly manipulated, of the first law. That is part of our model, this particular version of the first law. Um, all right, where do we go to now? Oh, yes, okay. Um, the geoid correction, we can solve these equations, we can work out what that is, and that also will affect the um, uh, temperature, background, density, and pressure to a very small extent measured by that parameter um, delta. I'm not going to explore that here. Um, oh, that's what I just said. It's really what happens at epsilon that I'm hoping I can convince you makes all of this worthwhile. Right, so. Dynamics and thermodynamics, we're looking at the troposphere, but so we've made that choice for the temperature and variation, which eliminates the velocity field at leading order. So we have a, a background state, um, which, which is the classical one, albeit in, in spherical geometry. So we're now going to have a look at what arises in this scheme with those parameters that I've described to you um, at order epsilon. So we find that we get that system of equations. We are perturbing a background state, so you'd expect to see a linear system. Indeed, that is what we've got. You would have to distort time and space if you want to start seeing nonlinearity at leading order. You won't see that happening in this particular system. Uh, so we've got here um, terms which some of you might recognize, or bits of terms that some of you might recognize. That is the complete story. So we've got here one, two, the first three are the components of Navier-Stokes. Mass conservation, the equation of state, and now this extended version, it's the perturbation of what I showed you before of the first law. Right. We can eventually reduce. The rho naught is the background density. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's all variable. Yes, yes, yes. yes there's, there's, there, we, we don't make any assumptions about it in terms of simplification. It's there. It's in the system. Um, the, we can eventually um, reduce that system of uh, particularly the first two equations after some manipulation to a form which, again, some of you might recognize, although you might have expected to say, I don't know, maybe a pressure um, term sitting over there or something like that, derivative thereof. Um, I'll just show you for completeness that it's just a matter of doing the manipulation just transform. You might observe in passing that the way in which temperature appears is here, which then appears there with all these extra bits and pieces. Obviously, the theta part of this is part of the spherical geometry. This is why I don't want to dwell upon the, the detail. That is pure manipulation. You can solve, um, simplify, and reduce to that pair of equations. <laughs> well, you might think of it as being a bit like a temperature. Look. Okay, it's so a weighted temperature, weighted relative. No, there's no density in there. No, 
But this is the background. That's the background temperature. This is the perturbation temperature. And to express the sigma, we've got to get it in terms of this function. It was a surprise when we found it. it wasn't what we were expecting. We thought it would be far simpler than that. Right. So the philosophy that we're adopting here now is if you, oh, let me go back for a second. If you think of that as being a forcing term, choose the forcing term and essentially solve the system. Well, no, it's not going to be as simple as that, is it? Uh, if we were able to choose a suitable sigma um, out of the blue, we would then get u naught and b naught. Those first two equations give us the horizontal velocity field. Then we use the um, uh, vertical component to give us the um, mass conservation to give us W. And then we can work out what the heat source is, interpreting it the other way around, as I've tried to indicate. Um, right. Of course, what you might do is to be guided in your choice of sigma one by the particular sort of problem that you're interested in, the particular application that you have in mind. But ultimately, in the system I'm using, we're using, then we choose that, get that, to get that, and then the first law. As you can hear, I've started to lose it. Hang on. <coughs> right, so. Uh, well, I'll explain that, haven't I? Um, once you've got that pair of equations, quite a number of applications follow directly from that pair of equations, suitably uh, choosing, defining, Sigma, sigma one. So we can get the atmospheric spiral. We get the geostrophic balance. We get the thermal wind. Have to be very careful with the thermal wind. It doesn't fall out naturally, but it is hidden in there. We can do the um, Hadley ferrule, uh, ferrule and polar cells. We can do the Walker circulation. Um, and all of that was the early part of the work so far as the atmosphere um, was concerned. Um, the important thing I claim is that it is absolutely upfront what's happened here. We know the equations we started with. You might criticize them, you might want to change them, of course, but you know exactly the equations we started with and you can see immediately what the approximations are that we've had to make to get to this stage. You can go to higher order terms if you want them. They are all available. You can um, identify them and you can um, uh, produce representations of those higher order terms if you want them. It's all up front. There's no hidden modeling. There's no um, uh, attempt here to write down a system of equations and then ask the question, well, what are we neglected? How, what's the relevance of the neglected terms? Here, my claim is you can see exactly what the neglected terms are. They are all built into the system. You can read them off. Uh, right. Yeah, that's right. That's essentially, that's what it amounts to. Different sigma ones will give you a different application, essentially. Within the family that I've just described, yes, that's it. That, that, that is the beauty. We haven't got lots of separate problems, each one set up to solve each one of these. This system will, will give you a description of all of those if you make the right choices at, this, at the sigma one stage. I'm not sure what you I don't. Yep. Yep. Oh, I can't remember. It may actually be zero. I think it will be zero, actually, in that case. That just vanishes because the equivalent is going to give you that. It's just that balance, isn't it? Albeit, remember, we're in spherical coordinates, so this, this is valid over a large region. It isn't just at a, at a point. So if, it were, if sigma one is independent of theta and phi, you'll get the classical Eggman spiral in spherical coordinates. But, yes, if you, sorry, if you go right back at the beginning, I said this was for the steady. If you wait, just nearly there. Okay, we now look at a little bit further and said, this time I keep the time in, okay? Um, so we'll use the time scale that we had before. So that's about the three and a half hours. Um, the, uh, you're going to get a structure 
which is similar to the one you've just seen. Here's the extra term. The complication is that the, um, uh, oh, sorry, that's straightforward. I'll define these functions for you in a moment. Um, uh, the forcing term is defined as that. I'll get to the point that matters in a moment. Right. The, when you have um, an unsteady problem, the equation of uh, the, the first law takes a slightly different form. And that is what I've written down here, which makes things look rather different. You've got some additional terms here. Even if the very basic structure whoops, looks the same, we have now got a different definition for this. It doesn't relate to the sigma one that you've seen. And obviously, we've got the time dependence in. Right, so let's go again. Okay, the it's a matter of just doing the, the manipulation. Um, and yeah, okay, I think everything's defined there. Um, one thing that comes out of this immediately is that that function f1 that you see me developing there rather quickly, um, can be related directly to the Brunt Weierstrahler um uh, frequency. It is exactly as indicated, the non dimensional version of it, exactly as indicated there. Um, we can then make choices. As I indicated in the um, uh, previous uh, description for steady motion, so that we can now look at standing where, well, all the usual things that you'd expect to see for unsteady motion, classical results in the atmosphere. Um, right up to the point, providing you um, scale of distances appropriately with using epsilon then you can even have nonlinear waves and something a bit like the morning glory. And that'll be the basis of, of talk I'll give next week, which is going to be much more detailed than I'm trying to be here today. Uh, right. So I'm going to pause there. I think we're OK. for Yes, we're, we're OK. I'm now going to briefly. Sorry. OK, but I'm quite happy to leave it there. So we've got. Um, Kelvin, we've got Rosby, we've got buoyancy gravity waves. Yep. And others. I've only given you an, a, a sample there. Well, that corresponds to... That corresponds... Is that a um, combination? Is that Kelvin and uh, gravity? Surely that ought to be. I would have thought it was there. Yeah. Yes. Yes, we are. We are. We've obviously. We are. Right. So now, let's very briefly touch on um, oceanic. So the philosophy is exactly the same, but it is, of course, in many respects significantly simpler. It's obviously an incompressible fluid. There's essentially no thermodynamics, not of the sort that we've just been talking about anyway. Most importantly, in terms of developing a systematic method of solution, there is no background state that you have to perturb. Okay? You have to perturb the background state if you're going to be dealing with the atmosphere. There is a general background state of the atmosphere, whether we regard it as being uh, a purely um, theoretical um, construct, there is a general background temperature, pressure, whatever, which the equations tell us are sitting there, even if what you actually see is a combination of background state and motion and whatever else. Here, for the ocean, that is not the case. There is no background state to be perturbed. The geoid correction that I've already described is available, but generally, and, we, and you can work it out, it's no, no hardship at all, but quite often it is just totally ignored for the um, uh, extent of the oceans that we have on our planet of two, 3,000 miles across, something like that. Um, these changes um, combined lead to a number of different variants that we can now explore using the philosophy that I've already indicated. Uh, oh, there's the, back, the background papers, and, and uh, I think I commented on this a little bit earlier. These are slightly earlier because we started work on the ocean before we then moved to the, uh, the atmosphere. Yeah, with reference to? Yes, yes. Um, 
we 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 we, we can we can incorporate variable density. We can incorporate variable density. It, it's relatively straightforward to do. And we can we can model that, and it's not a a big step. And it just begins, makes the equations a little bit more complicated, but that can all be accommodated. So in that sense of salinity, whatever, um, thermoclines, we've looked at those problems as well, embedded within this system. I just don't have time to cover all the bases, I'm sorry. It, it, I'm just saying they all come in the same order in this system. It isn't treated as a background state. It's just a variable density. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If you if you wish to interpret that as the background state, which is reasonable, then that's that's built in. That's already been removed. So the um uh the the, the normal pressure distribution. If the pressure is measured relative to that pressure distribution. Yeah. Um, right. So now let's get back on track. Um, so if you choose, what we're now going to do is to make slightly different choices. When we did the atmosphere, we just took the um, essentially the, the thickness of the atmosphere as our fundamental measure relative to the radius of the Earth. We're now going to make slightly different choices. Different choices lead to slightly different constructs, as you'll see. So if we take as our depth scale a typical depth of the ocean, um, and uh, for the moment anyway, I'll, get, I'll relax this shortly, and assume that the flow is inviscid, we reduce to that system of equations, um, and that can be used, for example, to describe large gyres, which would be driven by probably best choice is a choice of vorticity um choose the vorticity that will be appropriate for the gyre that you're interested in um some references there that's version one um version two um it, which is not available within the atmospheric system at least not accessible in the sense that we can actually solve the system then there are there are families of solutions which are exact the equations um, that we've started with, providing they're inviscid. And these can be used, for example, to describe, and these are exact, therefore they're going to have limited application in terms of the geometry of the Earth. Um, so, for example, the azimuthal um, equatorial flow is going to go all the way around the Earth. You would have to work at it to cut it off. Um, and the Antarctic circumpolar um, current can be extracted as um, special solutions of that system of equations. So that's a, that's the second version. Right, version three. Let's use now the classical depth scale associated with Ekman layer in the um, ocean. Uh, I've just defined it there for you. Um, we will then get the unsteady equations um, similar to the ones that, you, that we saw for the atmosphere. So. Uh, if we were to get rid of the um, unsteady part here, then we'll have the equations that are, albeit with variable um, uh, viscosity, that are associated with the um, Ekman spiral in the ocean. Although, of course, we're in spherical coordinates, so this is valid over large regions. Uh, right, so, um, oh, I've just defined what the various time scales there are. Right. These equations can be used, obviously, from what I've just said, to, to describe the um, Ekman flow. Um, and we can also uh, look at the un unsteady version of that. So we can see a situation where there isn't a rotation, then a, a, a rotation builds up. Um, we can also use it because it's valid over large regions in spherical coordinates. We can use it to um, describe large areas of motion in what is equivalently the thin shell approximation. And of course, we can have variable viscosity, as you've just already seen in the equations. We can describe the particular flow driven by an assigned vorticity, maybe. Uh, right, so we've taken it one stage further um, by choosing an appropriate model for the surface boundary condition that will cover um, the 
uh, application of, uh, of an ice boundary condition, then we can look at um, flows that are typically in the Arctic Ocean, the Beaufort Gyre and the Transpolar Drift. Right, I'm going to pause there for a moment. Does that prompt anything else? Right, so, and remember, I have only tried to give you an overview. It's, it, it is impossible to give um, the fine detail here. So my claim is that it, 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 one can de develop all this driven by essentially, I'm putting the, um, the geoid correction to one side, but it is available, essentially by using the thin shell approximation. And that is the sole parameter I'm using throughout. That's the driver. Um, we have clearly, because we are making that assumption, nothing else. So F plane and beta plane, all the rest of it plays no role in this whatsoever. You never see it. It's quite irrelevant. You don't need it. Um, we have orbit in the thin shell. We have otherwise the complete description of the spherical um, geometry. And I claim we've managed to retain all the physical attributes of the flow. The Earth's geoid, well, okay, I've already commented on that. Um, that's best represented, we claim, by using a hybrid coordinate system, which means that the, the one that you're really working with, the detailed one, the one that you do the manipulation with, is the spherical system. Um, I made this point earlier on. This is what we're trying to do. This is what the asymptotic procedure does. It identifies and then extracts terms labeled via the parameter, in this case, the parameter epsilon at higher order. If you want to find out what the epsilon squared term is associated with, et cetera, you may do so. Um, we clearly have the dynamics and thermodynamics coming through at the same order, albeit we have to be a little bit careful about how we interpret it. We've tried to stop the dynamics and then go to the thermodynamics, um, bearing in mind that we've already written down a version of the first law, which may miss out some things. We, they can be included in the big scheme of things. Uh, I've just said that, haven't I? Right, so um, I claim that all the familiar results, or virtually all the familiar results, um, for the atmosphere and for the ocean are recovered from our single system of equations, our asymptotic system of equations, by making suitable choices. Um, I also claim that we are quite sure about what we're doing. You can disagree with it, of course, naturally, but you can be sure what we have done. These are the equations. You can write them down. You can now uh, non-dimensionalize, put in your parameters, and you can then identify what has been left out and the reason for leaving it out. You can go to higher order terms if you want to find out what those uh, extra correction terms are. So my claim is that the assumptions and the approximations are upfront. You can see precisely what is going on. Um, so uh, in terms of the atmosphere, uh, we're not approximating the atmosphere in some um, vague way, constant temperature or whatever it might be. We have uh, an accurate background state of the atmosphere. It is a solution of the governing equations. Um, the standard models can be described with errors accessible. Oh, I've just, I said that a moment or two ago. I forgot it was coming up. So um, there are no geometrical restrictions other than the thin shell. So F plane and beta plane play no role whatsoever. You can obviously include variable viscosity um, and uh, not only the ones that we have done, we've started to explore other applications of this system of equations by making different choices in, for sigma one, for example, to enable us to look at other flows, which we believe can be accommodated using this particular approach. Thank you.